Dr. Darrell Capon. Welcome everyone. And this is a really great time for us here at the Academy to be able to, again, uh, kind of bring our researchers, I hate to say that they're in the basement, but out of the basement, uh, because office space can be at a premium around San Francisco, and actually bring them out on the floor. We try to highlight as much research around the building, as you can see, as possible, but it doesn't always do the same thing that having you here with all of you can kind of give us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Now, uh, I have to back up for a moment and say I love the way you're dressed. We feel very authentic, don't we? <laughs> do you feel like we're about to go on an expedition? So do you normally dress like this? So this is embarrassing, but yes, I do dress like this. Um, in fact, I just went on a field trip to Costa Rica, and these are new one-use one snake boots. And um, my wife here is the curator of microbiology, and we won't talk about that today. But, but she um, and I went to Corcovado National Park in Costa Rica, and there are so many snakes there. My old boots used to be about this high. They were military boots, and they were worn out. In fact, I'd worn them out three times. And the uh, last pair they gave me for re re free was called, they stamped as is on it. So um, uh, I had to buy a new pair. And uh, we did see five fair to lance snakes on that field trip. And I even have a picture. So I bought a pair for myself to replace them. And I thought, you know, I have to buy a pair for my wife just because it's the right thing to do. At any rate, I have a picture of her boot next to a snake. So. Quite the gentleman. Yeah. Quite the gentleman. <laughs> uh, now, real quickly, Ferdinand snake, um, somewhat of a venomous snake. I think somewhat is not a correct descriptor, is it? Right. No. It's called the Equis in Ecuador or the Terciopelo in, in uh, Costa Rica. And the bite of this snake from a very small one, I got a picture of a tiny one that was about 20 inches long, um, is deadly. And they, are, they have tissue destructive venom, like a rattler. And they have a bit of neurotoxin in there, so the cocktail is not fun. I am not an expert on these snakes, but I do have to be aware of them, so I don't... I guess the... Let me, let's it's an interesting let, yeah, point. Let's end with this thing. I've well, led trips, 112 um, volunteers from Earthwatch in the past during my PhD, and our rule was to know where your hands, your feet, your head, and this were at all times. And literally, because you're walking through the jungle, if you're step on one, that's, about, that's a problem unless it, it, it's going to hit this, but they, some of the species actually hang in the trees. So you've got a, essentially we use a butterfly net. Oh my God, I forgot my butterfly net. I knew I was going to forget something. Do you oh folks well. ever get to work and all of a sudden just think, where's my butterfly net? Well, there's plenty of pictures of them here. We'll get to those. So you are not a herpetologist. No. Expert on reptiles and amphibians, but you do know a lot about them. And that is to enable you to do your job in entomology a little bit better, it sounds like. That's right. All right. So within entomology, insects? Insects. And I actually started out with butterflies. And now I'm, I'm being really lazy. But I mentioned that word genome. I now study insects which have a genome sequence so that we can use that. Essentially, the, the primary job of a museum biologist is to discover new species. Most of my colleagues discover new species. But we can actually go back and retread those discoveries by looking at all of the genes instead of just a few of them to figure out what their relationships are. We can look at all of them and to figure out, say, maybe how did they evolve their unique characteristics. And that's, that's what I do. Now, you mentioned the ones that have a genome sequence. Are there ones that don't have genomes? How well, everything has a genome. And after 1994, the first large metazoan, a fly, was genome sequenced. And then in 2001, 2002, we had humans. And th there's now a land office business of sequencing genomes. And there is the Thousand Genomes Project for Humans. Now we have well over a thousand individuals have been sequenced. And there are the 10,000 insects projects. And there's all these different projects. Everybody wants to study. Basically, it's like an encyclopedia written in the individual genome of each insect. Each individual here, we could theoretically sequence a genome from these specimens right here in the long run. And so what you're doing is using the information that a scientist has already gleaned. They've already sequenced that genome, yeah. so you don't have to do that part of the work yourself. Well, okay, so if I was really smart, I would be doing that with humans. And we have a postdoc right now. It's a, 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 a man who just received his PhD, and he's working with us for six months. Then he's going to go study human genomes, mostly from Africa, 
and all of the data have already been collected. But we're kind of studying things which are a little more obscure, so we have to do some of our own work. So we're sequencing genomes of butterflies, flies from Hawaii, and um, parts of the genomes of insects which transmit viruses. The genome of the insect is so large, it's the same size as a human genome, that we don't want to sequence all of it, so we just select parts. So if we take a look, these are a few that you're working on, and some of them I see butterflies in the corners. Yeah. And then, I, I tell us. So this is a hammerhead fly from Hawaii, and I just, we just moved here from Hawaii about two years ago. And I call these the shaka fly, that's the hang loose sign, you know, you've seen it in the surf shop. So these two flies are incredible. They, um, those are two males, and they're essentially competing in a little tiny arena. Not like, not like a, a Hollywood movie, but a little tiny st top of a log or a mossy area. And they're competing for space to access females, to find females, to say, hey, look at me, honey, I'm really tough. So that's what they're doing right now. And, and these are amazing. They have big, big eyes, sort of hypertrophic, that means grown large and then they have amazing behavior. And I'm sure we will talk about this sometime soon because we are now about ready to rece receive seven genome sequences, but in raw form, which is just a pile of data. Imagine pickup sticks, 100 base pairs long. Remember we said it's billions of base pairs for humans. The genome of those guys is 230 megabases. That's 230 million base pairs, and it's going to we're going to receive it on a hard drive or over the internet as a pile of 100 base pair pieces with a little insert that's 400 or 500 base pairs long and another piece. And then we have to do, basically most of my work is in front of a computer. It's essentially like decoding a puzzle. I, I was going to ask, it sounds like kind of digital puzzle work. That's right. Wow. Yeah. I'm still taking it all in. Okay. Yeah. So you so need <laughs> math and boots to be able to do this. <laughs> Two very important keys to your work. Yeah. Now, where does all this take you? What are you focusing on with all of this? Okay, so right now, I'm focusing on a very, very exciting thing. Most, I, I can't go into all of the details today, but most of evolution and what we're focused on in this part of the academy, and you should take some time to look at the examples, are how diversity occurs by those mutations I was talking about being found in one or the other branch or different populations from a common ancestor. So imagine we have an area like this full of individuals of a species, maybe these blue dots. And right down in the middle comes a river or a lake or a mountain range, dividing them into two populations. Over time, just through chance, those genomes will start to vary and the group of, species, uh, group of individuals on this side will start to diverge from the group of individuals on that side. And that eventually can lead, as Darwin amazingly hypothesized, um, into different species. That's evolution. It's the basic, basic mechanism of evolution. So that describes what we call bifurcation. You don't know how we like to flip a coin, it's got heads or tails, it's two. Two splitting, that's what I mean. Hmm. So the tree of life starts out and goes like this, and every species divides like that. Now, because we're sequencing genomes, we're finding the tracks of other species. For instance, a third species in the mix. And we're like, this does not fit our model. We like bifurcation. It, it's math. The math is easier. We can draw the pictures easier. And that's how we started thinking. In fact, Darwin drew a little picture of a tree, which presaged this whole enterprise of describing the relationships of species by drawing a tree that says this one and this one are sisters, closest relatives, and then there's a cousin, and then over here there's a distant cousin, and then way over there there's somebody in Outer Mongolia. I mean, essentially we have this tree diagram, and that's generally the case. But when things have diverged a little bit, but not too much, there's a sweet spot where they can get back together again. And sometimes that leads to the collapse of the species, and you just get one species. But sometimes, rarely, it can lead to uh, another bifurcation, that great word, into a third species. And that's what I'm working on right now. And that's what that first little image was, but we've got plenty of it. Oh, oh. Okay, keep asking me what you want to do, because oh. I'm going to take you over. You got me so excited yeah. here about yeah. all yeah, so this essentially, bifurcation. Essentially, imagine, don't look at this one yet, these two split sometime in the past, 
and their genomes are diverging. I like the pencil drawing because we like to draw things in the back of an envelope or a napkin. And then a little bit of genetic information occurs. Maybe one time a female got in the wrong area. She mated with this female, mated with this species, and boom, out popped another species. That's what we're studying right now. And the only way to do that is to look at every single part of the genome of these butterflies. Now, real quickly for you folks, if we again ignore that, would you guess that these two were different species? Or would you guess that they were the same? I think most of us would probably guess different. I think we're going to talk more about that sure. in a little bit. Uh, now, we moved on to here, and you can see some really incredible diversity of butterflies, but check the background. And it looks like some green spots back there, but I think we're seeing some incredible diversity of leaves as okay, well. Okay, so let's get down to specifics. The butterflies I study are called the passion vine butterflies. They eat passion vines as larvae. So the females are experts at finding these vines, and they lay their eggs on those vines. And then the caterpillars eat those plants. But the passion vines are also on different places across different mountain ranges on other sides of streams, and they're diverging. So the butterflies appear to be following that divergence. So they're different species, have different host plants. That's what the female will lay their eggs on. And then on top of that, we get this diversity of colors and patterns. So it's a very special group to study evolution. It's what we call sort of a, a model system for studying evolution, sort of like uh, Darwin's finches or stickleback fish or humans for some, some of us. So this diversity of colors and patterns is atop a diversity of plant life. And in the background, by the way, these images are from one of my, one of my um, good colleagues and mentors, Larry Gilbert. And those are just different leaf shapes from one family. Can you believe that? That's weird. And these are just different colors from one genus, color patterns. It's one genus of butterflies, one family of plants but very specific within this, right, it sounds like. Right, right, right. Now, how did you, if we can step way back, how did you first get involved in wanting to study? Was okay. it the butterflies? Was it the genetics? Well, let me, let me give you a little background. I went to school at Berkeley as an undergrad, and I knew the academy. Then I went to British Columbia for my PhD. My advisor had star studied Darwin's finches, and I was in, really enamored by studying evolution in real time. We call it evolutionary ecology. And so I'd, I followed up on a project that he had been involved in studying song sparrows. You have them in your backyard and they were on an island in British Columbia. And this is really funny. I spent the whole summer there all by myself and I get to tell you my beard was really large and I didn't look this clean. <laughs> but I got done with that summer and said, wow, there's some variation. The island birds, the females are large and the ones on the mainland aren't. But how am I ever going to understand why larger bodies or longer legs matter on this island? I had no idea. And so I sat down and I grabbed a bunch of books off my advisor's shelf and in from the library, and I just piled them on my bed and I started reading from the top to the bottom. I wanted to find a system, a study system where I could study biodiversity and we had an idea why one thing over here was better than the other thing that was over there in this environment and vice versa. So I needed a model in order to study diversity and why different colors and patterns, in this case, occurred. And I found a, uh, an article written by the guy who took these pictures. And I said, wow, this is amazing. And he's, he was describing a relationship between organisms where two species look the same, but they're totally different. And they're sharing something. They're sharing a color pattern. So this relationship is known as mimicry. Has anybody heard of that before? So in butterfly mimicry, and we can also have mimicry between flies and bees and wasps, we have a species that's generally toxic and another one that may not be. That's one form of mimicry. So I can just let you guys all see this. These are pairs of mimic butterflies, and one's a model and one's a mimic. The toxic one's the model, and the um, not-so-toxic one is known as the mimic. So here's a milkweed butterfly, a monarch. And here is, I've got to read it upside down, a not-so-toxic one. And I can't read upside down. <laughs> anyway, these are common mimics from North America. But this group of species from South America and Central America that, that Dr. Gilbert studied has amazing, perfect mimicry. 
And so he was noticing that these species of heliconius butterflies, the, the passion vine butterflies, always looked almost identical to somebody else, sometimes within the same genus. So there's some more mimicry. Can you guys see that? So there's pairs of butterflies. And it turns out, in this case, the models and the mimics are both the same. They're both toxic. They're like stop signs and stoplights. So let me just deal with that for a second. Can you see that? Can you see those butterflies? Oh, they're pretty. So you get, later you can come up and look at these right afterwards, as long as you don't promise not to knock them off the shelf. We promise. <laughs> it's a little bit. But so imagine you're driving up, and all of a sudden a stoplight changes color. Instead of from green to red, it changes to purple or to blue. You're not going to know what to do, and you're going to go right through the, the intersection. In that case, it would be as if a single butterfly had variation within its species. One was red, and it was toxic, meant don't eat me, I taste bad. And another one that was a little rarer was green. In those conditions, the one that's more common will be favored. So the natural selection behind these warning signals favors the most common signal. And Dr. Gilbert said, hey, we figured this out. It works within species and between species when they're both toxic. So that led me to my PhD problem, which is to study variation within mimicry. Why would we get it? And I actually came to the academy on a, on a break and went into the collection and found the suggested study species, which I ended up studying, which was this species right here. So you can go on to the next slide if you want. So that's, that's how I kind of got into the, so I had to find variation essentially to study what's best here versus there. And that's what I did for my PhD. So you noticed something that intrigued you. You made an yeah. observation and you wanted to find a reason behind that observation. Right. Anybody ever notice something and you're like, I wonder why that is the way it is. Possibly every day you're doing science. But then there's a lot more science to come after that to <laughs> complete right. that cycle. And then I'd also like to touch on the fact that you are on a break but you were still perusing the collection, so it sounds like you're working while you're on breaks. Oh, yeah. We don't ever stop. That's actually kind of a problem. You've got to <laughs> disconnect, but oh, well. It's a, it's a, hard, a tough job. You've got to love what you do. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, your specific focus here, again, we're talking about genomics. We're talking about speciation. Yeah. And we're also talking about the tropics as well. How do you go through this? What process are you taking? So I'm going to have to make it really simple. Okay. Let's just imagine. So here's, here's the study I was talking about. In South America and Ecuador, I was told to go study these variable butterflies. You can see that this is one species. Oh, wait. This is one species. They're yellow in some places and white in the other. So I just went through and collected data on the yellow and the white butterflies. Let's see, and I would write it down in a field notebook. And you can imagine I was just catching butterflies. I'd make a mark on them so that I knew I already caught it. I'd usually write a number, actually, using one of these great pens, the Sharpie Ultra Fine Point. They're not paying me, by the way. And, um, Good and then I'd let it go, and then I'd catch another one. So I'd count the number of yellow and white butterflies. And the fundamental question was, well, why were they variable? And there were two other species that were also yellow and white. And so the stop signs and stop lights in one place was mostly yellow and in another place was mostly white. And what I did, my entire PhD was published in one paper in Nature. I basically moved the yellow and white butterflies into the opposite environment and showed that they didn't live as long. And that was first hypothesized by a man named Fritz Mueller. In, it was published in 1879 and he was inspired by Darwin He's the one who figured out the toxic, toxic mimicry called Mullerian mimicry. Both taste bad. So I got a, basically a nice, a nice result that showed that he was correct in the field. And that was kind of a big deal when I finished it. It was a lot of work. I went through three pairs of these boots. I bought and fixed and destroyed a Toyota Land Cruiser. Um, I'm not going to say how many air miles I got because I feel kind of guilty about those. But that's that sort of thing. Then came along another PhD student in Dr. Gilbert's lab, and he studied the same problem in Costa Rica. I'm sorry, it's kind of covered up here, but we were running out of time. And actually, you can see, here's these yellow ones on the west and these blue and white ones on the east. And so in western Ecuador, they're not divided by habitat. They're all over. Yellow and white ones occur in the same place. In Costa Rica, these are on the eastern forest, and these are on the western forest. And what we're interested in is why 
or how they, how they split. And I already showed you that picture. And you can imagine when these two, A and B, split, there's something going on. And we're trying to figure out what that is using genomes. That's all I can really explain. So we compare Ecuador, where there's no species, to Costa Rica, where there's species. And that's, in science, sometimes we, we can't go back in time. So we call it a space for time substitution. If I go to Ecuador, I get yellow and white butterflies. And we know the genetic basis of that but they're in the same family. If I go to Costa Rica, I have to drive all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific to get yellow and white butterflies, and they're in two different species, but it's the same genes. The yellow gene here and the white gene there are the same as the ones that are in, oops. Ever wonder if the park uh -oh. plants are more they cut than me off. <laughs> anyway. We thank you for your cooperation and patience, everyone. <laughs> Behind plants in the academy's landscape. This is where I want. Forget all of that nature walk. Hang out with us. Yeah, because yeah. Because I feel so, like I'm already on a nature so walk. So here we right go. Now. So here's this. It's easier to look at them in reality. And I'm going to ask you to not touch. But, um, and I don't want to drop them either. But these are the real butterflies in eastern Costa Rica and western Costa Rica, and then on both sides of the mountains. This is Heliconius malpomini. Heliconius pecinus and Heliconius sydno. And we just finished sequencing the genome of 10 of these, 10 of these, and 10 of these. And uh, if you want to get a closer look right afterwards, I'd be happy to show you if you're in the back. And what we found is that these two share almost all of the genome is almost identical, except for 12 regions that are 5,000 base pairs long and that we created sort of a, 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 a cutoff. They were saying these are really different enough to call them different. They're actually, there's a similarity across the genome. And in those regions are four regions that we already knew are responsible for the color differences. That's one on chromosome one. For the pattern differences in the four wings. For the patterns in the hind wings. And there's a little tiny bit of red. You have to just believe me, there's some orange there. And there's a little tiny bit of red on the bottom of this guy, which is hard to see. And there's differences there. See that little bit of red? It's hard to see. If you end up studying entomology, you will be licensed to pick up a pin butterfly. You can see all the data on the label and the little pieces of paper. That's very classic of our collections. So we're now with these gene sequences. We have 30 gene sequences, and we added two more, which were we put way down here, they're on a different branch of this tree. That way we could tell kind of the, the direction of all the characters. It's called an outgroup. And now with that information, I'm looking for genes that came from this, this one that show up uniquely in this one in those color pattern regions. And we found three of those five areas have a strong signal that came from this one. And that's sort of like a smoking gun on this hypothesis that at one point, see this little arrow? At one point, a female, maybe from here, got lost in the area with just these. And they didn't uh, find any males. And so they did their situation. And they ended up creating a variety of offspring that looked like a bunch of different color patterns. And these just happened to look like, and you can't quite see it because we covered it up, but another species. And so they use that mimicry signal. It's just like we imagine suddenly there is a new stop sign over here, and the stoplight evolved to look like that stop sign through what we're calling introgression or hybridization. Um, that's the big story. Mm -hmm. And um, this story follows a paper we published last year, which was the sequence of this species. So we have the complete genome of Heliconius melpomene, and that was published in Nature with 80 authors. I was number 30. <laughs> And I was responsible <laughs> with one other person for ordering all the bits using that pickup sticks mathematics I was talking about. And, um, and it's a draft order. We're still working on it. <laughs> but that's just like science. It's never really done. A lot of things in science seem to be draft order. Yeah. Well, that's true. So, this, so we're right here looking in this cloud. What's happening? And this is sort of a metaphor for understanding what happens when two species split. Is there an idea of what caused this split originally? Well, okay, so 
I guess we have the, in science, we have to talk about the proximate and the ultimate. This is very technical, but basically, we believe that the color pattern differences between the two species that are already there that are toxic, the model species, basically um, set up a situation where if an uh, individual of this species could look like that, then they would just immediately be way better off and they'd be able to fly around with impunity. And so, essentially, we think that they're sort of like a, almost like a little bit of an engine or a washing machine. If they're mixing, and that can happen, but most of those will fail because they don't look like either of the good model species. And eventually, if one pops out that looks right, boom, it'll take off. And the reason why we have this hypothesis is because Dr. Gilbert had his greenhouses and he was tinkering. He accidentally, one fly got in the other, one butterfly got in the other butterfly's cage and all of a sudden out popped an interesting hybrid. So he, 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 he crossed it back and eventually he could create essentially this from this and this. And that's just exactly how science occurs. You need to, it's not all, oh, we've got the right idea. If we just keep working, we're going to figure it out. You just happen to be interested and all of a sudden you say, what's this bread mold? And lo and behold, we get penicillin. It's the same exact process. Hmm. Very fortunate accidents sometimes. Yeah. Now, you do, as we can see, a lot to get to all of this point. And so I'd, I'd like to look at, at some of that. Uh, now, you said you forgot your butterfly net, but I think we've got a few got a images few of them, there. Yeah. They're huge anyway. <laughs> what all does it take to get you out there successfully and to get you back successfully and safe? So it's like a very extended weekend camping trip. So <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not a mystery or it's nothing special, but my first field trip, I had a backpack. I went to Ecuador. I got permits, which took about three weeks. And I got on a bus. I got off of a bus at the place where one of Dr. Gilbert's students suggested I go. And I stayed at a little hotel on the side of the road. And then I hiked up the hill in the morning and I saw the butterflies that I was going to study for the next six years. And amazingly, I mean, I had a first aid kit, a butterfly net, a hat. That was a straw hat back in the day. Um, some rubber boots if it's really wet. Those are also quite good snake proof protection. And my notebook. And I wrote all my information into a journal. And then when I caught something, I'd actually catalog it one specimen at a time. This is critical in the museum. These become the permanent records for every single collection we have in the entire museum, whether it's plant, animal or rock, mineral. <laughs> so when, I'm, when, I, when I ended up on that hill, one of the most important things to keep yourself safe is to have people know where you are and to have sort of a backup and a safety net. And I basically said to my fiance at the time, dear Shannon, I'm going down the mountain and I'll be in Ayurakeen and then I'm gonna go over here, here and here and I was gone and there was no cell phones. There were phones in some of the places, but basically I just went off on my own. And that's not very common anymore. But I found people along the way. So at the hotel, I tell them, hey, I'm going to walk up here. And if you don't see me by 8 p.m., I'd like you to send somebody up there to find out if I'm dead or not. I did this for a while. But that first day, I had incredible serendipity. It was amazing. I heard a car door slam. And I looked down. And I saw a man pulling out a long thing from the back of his car. And I was like, oh my god, maybe I'm trespassing. And it was a butterfly net. <laughs> And it was an Italian butterfly biologist, and his name was Tommaso Raschielli. And it was amazing. He said, oh, hola. And I said, hola. And I walked down there, and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for Heliconius sidno and Heliconius sappho and Heliconius eleuchia. These are Latin names that we give to the species. And amazingly, he said, oh, I know exactly where those are. What are you doing? Oh, it's my PhD. And he goes, oh, just jump in. And he showed me. So everything in my entire PhD worked out that way. But some things later, I think, got, well, slightly more rigorous, maybe. Sure, sure. So on a recent trip where Dr. Gilbert was actually with us, we were hiking, and there was a large swollen stream. So I took the local br bridge. And um, this is just one of the many bridges I almost died on. But these are essentially boards with two cables. And you've got to be very careful. This is the second of two images. I was walking along with two nets like this. And then I slipped, and the nets almost flipped off, and I almost fell down. That's not, that would not be fun. That's, that's before. I'm looking like, hey, no problem. And then 
after. Ah! <laughs> so that's pretty, that's pretty typical. Um, you have to be able to navigate very well. So you need to know where you are. And there's not necessarily trails in every place. And so. you mentioned your boots. Yeah. And you're taking a nice hike on the beach there. This is in Corcovado, the main access. There's three ways to get in. You can hike down the beach. You can take a b boat. Oh, here you go. There's, here's my wife, Shannon's snake boot with a very torpid or quiet um, uh, Ekkies or fair to lands. And this, this, this looks bad, but this snake's actually this big. I use a monopod in a remote release with a wide angle lens. And even if the snake fully extended, it couldn't touch your boot. But that's a snake root boot. So this is a be, be careful sort of picture. A very careful recreation. Yeah, of we recreated the what might happen. Well, she did step over. She didn't know it was there until she, she walked back and she saw it. And it had been there a long time. If you notice, there's a little bird dropping that was on the snake. So oh. that, that's like a marker of how long it had been sitting there. And most of these snakes are amazing. They sit and wait. And this is one species. And we saw a six-foot individual of this species. That would not be good. There's another species, um, the Bushmaster. And its head is essentially the size of my hand. So you wouldn't want to run into that guy. But they're sit and wait predators. So when you step over a log or anything, you've got to take your net and kind of run it on the other side to make sure there's nothing there and take a look. Because that would be potentially fatal. But despite these, well, possible setbacks and yeah. possible difficulties or just difficulties, you yeah. have some accomplishments, don't you? Sure. So that's my PhD yeah. there. All right. Well, that's a great explanation of the, uh, of the uh, experiment, moving the different butterflies into the environments dominated by the different um, models or stop signs. Mm -hmm. That's not it, though. You've so here, here's the neat thing. We can talk about Ecuador's and compare it to Costa Rica. And Ecuador being yellow or white doesn't matter. You'll still mate with either. But in Costa Rica, this is why we know they're different species. So here, this is the, the on the x-axis is how likely a male is to mate with their own species. And if they're white, they like white. And if they're yellow, they like yellow. That's the... That's the fundamental definition of species right there. And you can see in Ecuador and Costa Rica, the yellows are on the west and the whites are on the east. Pretty clear so it's split. really basic, basic biology, but it had never been worked on before. Mm -hmm. And I can see the suspense building yeah, in your eyes. Yeah, so, so we used... <laughs> You've so got even more. So we were able to use the genome sequence to study this introgression that we're studying here in Costa Rica, and the sort of the, one of the main results from this mimicry from this butterfly genome paper was an initial understanding that these genes are being used to make these big jumps in what we call the color pattern of the butterfly, and that's that's pretty novel. Otherwise, it would take a long time to get the mutations to look perfectly like another butterfly. So they're sharing these things like a tool. Essentially, like here, have a, have a couple of alleles at this <laughs> locus, and then you're all said, or be like taking off my jacket and giving it to you to look mm -hmm. like a different color. Mm -hmm. So some really cool insights into these things, and beautiful. Yeah, beautiful they're beautiful organisms. Well. This, I took this just about two and a mm -hmm. half weeks ago in Corcovado National Park, and that's an area where this um, yellow striped species is that we're talking about. So how would you say this is affecting us? Here at the Academy, we say we explore, explain, and sustain life. So how so do we you have, feel we have, keeping I that I sort up? of have two, two things I'd like to take home to you. One is, I just recently heard this from my wife. She was at a conference, and they were reassembling Neanderthal genomes from human genome sequences. So this kind of process of mixing has occurred even in us whether you like it or not. So you can look that up. And the other thing is that the areas and the places that I study are essentially not just examples, but they're critical parts of our Earth's ecosystem. So look at this. This is Corcovado National Park here in Costa Rica. This is on the west side. This is where these photos were taken from just a few weeks ago. And here in Corcovado, we have essentially the last lowland rainforest that's contiguous with the ocean all the way from there to there. And in the entire um, Pacific Rim on, on the, in, the, in the Americas, 
That's the last piece of rainforest, with the exception of maybe one or two very steep places in the Darien Gap, which is between Central and South America. So you can see a jaguar on the beach right here. So it's obviously a pretty neat place to go. Mm. Fairly scary if you're um, walking around at night without boots on. Um, but these are, there's, there are monkeys, and then there are monkey relatives. <laughs> we have, we have this, is, this is my um, colleague and collaborator, Andres Vega, and his son. And he is actually working on um, trying to get world heritage status for this national park. Even though it's a national park, it requires continual mm -hmm. input um, at every level to maintain its viability as a, as a conservation area. And one of the, the key things is that many tourists go here um, and they take advantage of facilities that, again, that the scientists set up to do these studies. So we kind of have to make some sort of balance there. Mm. And then we, I think one of the most important things is I like to show um, Roberto and his dad because this is how we learn about nature and pass on our passion for nature. So to bring our children and our children's friends out into nature and go to schools and, and basically tell these stories. That's the only way we can really hope to inspire the rest of the, the planet. And despite the fact that some of these really cool areas, as you're saying, have some of the uh, amazing megafauna, jaguar on the beach, yeah. every little thing we learn about that helps to encourage conservation of that area. Oh, for sure. For Absolutely. Sure. So how would you say um, we can get involved in something like this? What role could we all play as citizen scientists? Well, I, I don't have a project right here in San Francisco right now, but um, in, in our, in our um, recreation, so to speak, we literally go out and take advantage of the incredible beauty of North America and California. And uh, I'm sort of, my, my, my biggest uh, extracurricular activity right now is to infect my daughter with my enthusiasm for nature. So there you go, you can see her when she's young. It looks Hawaii, like it's working. And, and a little older here. And this is just in Northern California. Um, and then I think the, 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 main, the main sort of prescription is to be positive. We have a backyard right here in San Francisco. We can clean our beach. We can go to the Marin Headlands and, and partic participate in a flora study. There are so many ways to get involved. Yesterday, literally, with my daughter, I was looking over the edge of a cliff at elephant seals. And we were crawling on the dirt, so we didn't fall off the cliff. And we had our heads over like this. Sorry. And, you know, I think that's enough to, she knows that this environment here is supernatural in the Bay Area. And really, regardless of where you, any of you folks may be from or are heading towards, as you're saying, there are really amazing things, whether it's geology, geography, animals, biology, you name it, the A list can Z, go yeah. on. Exactly. You can find that anywhere all across the country, all across the state, all across the city, wherever it may be. So I think this is a really great reminder of all of that. And uh, I don't know about any of you folks, but I'm feeling a little bit excited, a little bit motivated. Anybody else? I had a feeling some of us were. Well, with all of that said, I just like this picture. Folks getting quite involved here. <laughs> Checking this out some plants. Is, this is a high school that I work with in Hawaii, and we're studying an invasive mosquito that transmits a nasty virus. But that's another story. Work with your wife? Yep. <laughs> and that may be another chat. That might be another chat Hopefully sometime soon. Hopefully soon to yeah. come. And once again, the doctor. <laughs> well, I would like to first of all thank you for coming in. But before sure. we all thank you, does anybody have any questions that we haven't covered yet? Yes, ma'am. I think you actually answered this. Before we could map a gene, how did we determine what made a species a species? Because it's like if they were green, they were in the same species. Is it that simple? So Ernst Meyer was a German biologist who did most of his career in the, in the U.S., and he was an ornithologist. And he had a, a, a concept that essentially was that, that, that species were different if they couldn't cross. And um, so that is the, the fundamental definition. And what that means is essentially that that means that they're not, they're the, the, the groups of individuals that form the populations aren't exchanging genes. And therefore, the genomes that they have can start to diverge. And that's what's so paradoxical about this little 
this little sort of sketch on the left is that occasionally even a little bit of crossing across the species boundary didn't it didn't it, most of the time it would cause them to collapse into one species and that's actually a very important conservation problem but we but but occasionally in history we've seen where a little bit of in, uh, genetic information transferred from one species to another causes a split between one species and a new daughter species, which is amazing. And if that is common, and that's what we need to start to do, is to figure out how common that is, that would accelerate evolution and it would accelerate understanding of how diversity is generated. So you're right, the, the, the litmus test is to throw them in a cage and see if they cross. If they do cross in a cage, you have to ask, is it common in nature? Because the cage may be an artificial environment. They may be, there are ducks that are quite capable of crossing in the cage, they don't in nature. They have different places to live, different times to breed, and different um, calls and songs, and all those things keep them separate. And these, base, these details, the little tiny details, are what's so fascinating about being a biologist. And one of the reasons why I'm excited to be working here is to inspire you guys to do the same thing. Or maybe we don't even know what it'll be by the time you're grown up. Good answer. Great question. Yeah, very good question. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, so, okay, so a fundamental principle in evolution is that the primary variation between two copies of a single gene is random because a mutation is random. But these color patterns have already been tried and true. So this color pattern has been selected to look like a model species for a long time, and so is this one. So when we have this crossing event, it's not just a random flip. It's potentially, it is random segregation of all the different possible co genes that these two species have that, it, that affect their color. But then the one that pops out could have already been a useful adaptation in this species. So for instance, this yellow bar here is very similar to that yellow bar there, right? And it's not quite that simple because you have to, you have to I don't know if you remember your high school biology textbook, but you've got wrinkled and smooth peas and different things like that. But essentially, if you cross this one to this one and then cross them back to this one and do it two generations, you get a whole distribution of possible phenotypes. And one corner of that looks like that. And so in a sense, it, it's not the recreation of this yellow pattern all randomly, but the, ultimately the yellow was created here or was whatever the genetic basis of yellow here if you go way down the tree, had a mutational um, beginning, but it's being reused, so to speak. And this is a very controversial sort of um, way, way of thinking. The botanists have known this forever because botany, it's really easy to see with those leaf shape or the flower differences. They look like a mix between two species. But most animal examples are, are rather new and we need genetic data to back them up. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay, so there's a, there's a contingency always. I mean, this event required these species to be in the same place and one or two of them, one, one or two individuals to not have a mate. So you wouldn't know how to predict that, but you could try in the greenhouse to see what you might get. Um, I think that, well, okay, so I'm an evolutionary biologist. No biology makes sense without evolution. It's a famous quote. And um, from Dobjonsky, actually, he was a fly biologist. But uh, the bottom line is that it's, we can predict the sort of aggregate behavior, so make sort of general statements, but it's very hard to, you would never, I would never have guessed that this and that would equal that. Look, it looks totally different. Turns out you actually have to have a, this is red and that's black. And if you turn the red gene off, which has now been sequenced, we know where that is. This basically encodes a black patch. So you have to, you have two things going on there. We may never look at butterflies the same way again. <laughs> but that's not entirely a bad that's thing, good. is it? No. Yeah, absolutely. Now, talking about some of the speciation, uh, at least within the building on our public Oops. floor, um, feel free, check out the earthquake exhibit. 
goes into this just a little bit. And we also have our Tree of Life display around here um, where you can actually kind of use your hand as that barrier to create some of these splits that Darrell was talking about earlier and kind of an interesting way to envision some of these concepts that we've been discussing. So with all of that said, can we give him a great big thank you? Thanks. <laughs>